Hello, hello, hello. Looks like we're, we're filtering in here. Good evening, everyone. So nice to see so many folks turn out this evening for this. Um, just so, so glad you all made it. Um, I think we're, we're gonna get started here. Yeah, are we ready, Jefferson? All right. Um, I mean, let me pull up my little script here. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Bryn Saito, and just so happy to welcome you tonight to our first ever Creative, Rise, Creative Writing Prize Showcase, celebrating the 2021 award winners of the annual Creative Writing Prizes, which are supported by the Academy of American Poets, the Department of English, and our generous community donors. So I'd first like to acknowledge that we are broadcasting from the Central Valley of California, the traditional homelands of the Yokuts and Mono peoples. I wanna thank Dean Nora Chapman, who's here tonight. Hello, Nora. And Interim Dean Associate, um, Interim Associate Dean Sergio Laporta, also um, with us this evening from the College of Arts and Humanities. Thank you both for your ongoing support of our students. Huge thanks to our department chair, Dr. Melanie Hernandez, and our wonderful staff in the English department, Lisa Galvez, Jefferson Beavers, and Sydney Hinton, our student assistant. A few uh, reminders before we get started this evening. So we ask that you keep your microphone muted tonight. Um, we have lots of speakers and they'll be muting and unmuting themselves as we go. So please stay on mute if you're a guest. We'll be spotlighting the main speakers and we'll also be sharing a couple of videos that are pre recorded that the students have submitted. So we recommend speaker view, um, which you can uh, do at the bottom of your screen. So, kind of highlighting the speaker view is the best, I think, viewing experience for the evening. We do have live captioning enabled if you'd like to see subtitles. So you go to the bottom of your screen and click on live transcript then show subtitles for those. And we invite you to use the reaction emojis at the bottom of your screen to show your love for our readers, to show your applause and hearts and all of that. Um, and also to use the chat function to give shout outs and praise as we, as we go along. So we are very excited this evening. We have 10 writers who are going to read for you, eight performing live with us and two video recordings. Uh, the poets and writers will be reading from their prize winning work, which was reviewed and selected by our judging panel of nationally recognized authors. So huge shout out and thanks to the writers, Ashley Wells, Navdeep Singh Dillon, Anthony Cody, and Stephen Kleinman for the time and energy you spent reading submissions and supporting our students with your generous comments. And I'm gonna put a, um, a little link in the chat here um, for folks who want to see some of the judges' comments on this, on students' works. Um, you can read that blog post that we wrote. Okay, with that, we are going to begin. Um, so our very first reader tonight is Amber L. Carpenter. Amber is the graduate student winner of the Fresno Creative Nonfiction Prize. And Amber is a lifelong, sorry, I blocked my screen, is a lifelong something, a lifelong Central Valley native who's entering her second year in Fresno State's MFA program. Her writing can be found in Hobart, Entropy, and Flies, Cockroaches, and Poets. Please join me in welcoming Amber L. Carpenter. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be reading from a piece called The Cartography of Shame and Womanhood. The closest I've ever gotten to experiencing the magnificent burden of motherhood was the three minutes I waited for pregnancy test results in a Target bathroom stall. While crouched in the corner of the handicapped bathroom, I saw visions of myself holding an infant, my infant, on the changing table. I'd tickle its little tummy before I gingerly changed the diaper, wrap it back up in its tiny little clothes, and we would continue on. I imagined myself pushing a stroller in exercise clothes on a brisk February morning, maybe grabbing coffee with another mother of a tiny stroller bound infant, exchanging breastfeeding horror stories or complaining about the lack of sleep, but lamenting on how worth it it is to have tiny miracles in our midst. You should take a plan B, he said to me as I uncrumpled my body and began to root around for my clothes on his bedroom floor. 
It slipped off halfway through. He gestured toward the condom on the ground and I felt horror rush over my body. When he offered to pay for half, I politely declined and said I would handle it. I rolled off of the mattress on the floor and put on my pants in the glow of the second Fast and the Furious movie. His room was basic in the way that most men's bedrooms are. It was painted some shade of eggshell and featured an obtrusively large television, messy cords from gaming system, and one of those Himalayan salt lamps built to detoxify the surrounding air. As I made my way downstairs, I saw my belongings strewn across the living room, my sweater in one corner, my glasses in another, and my purse sitting on the kitchen counter. I slipped on my shoes as I dug around for my keys before even leaving the house, making sure I had everything to ensure I'd never have to walk in again. I know I didn't scream the second I'd gotten into my car, but when I replay that January morning in my brain, I edit that part in with great detail. In my imagination, the scream wasn't shrill and fearful. It was guttural, the primal kind of scream that signifies loss from a mile away. I scream all the way home. I scream in the shower as I turn the knob to get the hottest water possible to exfoliate my shame. I scream as I throw on an orange mock turtleneck and go to Walgreens. I scream as I scan the aisle for the packaging I can recognize only from commercials. I scream as the employee checking me out tells me it's $53 to ensure I'm not carrying my rapist child. I scream as I rip apart the packaging inside my Corolla and read the possible side effects of ensuring I am not carrying my rapist child. I only stop screaming to dry swallow the pill. As the timer on my iPhone ticked down to zero, I wondered what kind of mother I would be. Gentle, but firm, open, but mindful of boundaries, encouraging, but intentional. It was then that I realized the caveats that surrounded potential motherhood. I thought of my own mother, charismatic and warm as she was absent and preoccupied. She never made promises or freshly baked cookies or homemade Valentines with me at the kitchen table the night before the classroom party. When my parents divorced a little less than 10 years into their marriage, my mother was 32. Within a year or two of my dad moving out of our double wide trailer, she made the decision to go back to school. I think about how scared she must have been. A young mother with two small children who looked nothing like her, trying to communicate to people through a thick accent and navigating what it meant to be an immigrant divorcee with a husband reckoning with his lifelong queerness. Much like other single mothers, her days were long. Her day job was as a teacher's aide for a middle school special education class. After her regular school day was done, she'd then work a shift at an after school program before going home, eating scrambled eggs with canned green chile, and heading to her night classes at the local community college. My brother and I had a rotating schedule of babysitters, neighbors, and family friends who would pick us up from school and let us sit in their living rooms until our mom picked us up after her night classes. When I became old enough, she taught me how to make spaghetti and kept the house stocked with things like banquet brand frozen fried chicken and oven lasagnas as a mean to make sure we were fed as she pursued her bachelor's degree. On the weekend, she would invite her friends over to drink decaf coffee and paint their fingernails at her kitchen table while they watched Sabado Gigante and caught each other up. On Sunday mornings, we would watch movies before she made us alphabet soup or Spanish rice and folded the laundry in neat square piles on her bed. She never showed fear. Her neuroses showed itself in different ways, obsession with cleanliness, buying beautiful clothing she didn't really need but wanted anyway, exercising whenever she could. She was beautiful and always smelled nice and the other teachers at school would call her Macy's because her outfits were always well curated. No one could have known how scared or broke or tired she probably was. I didn't know. We were so good at hiding from one another, eclipsing one anxiety for the other while all while orbiting around the very idea of survival. I buried my anxiety in books and food and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My mother and I both suffered in silence and often directed the aggressive resentment that comes with anxiety at one another, but we knew just we just wanted the other to feel okay. I wonder now, how could she have not screamed that primal guttural scream every day? Screaming while she learned to pay, bill, pay the bills my father used to. Screaming after dropping her two children off to school. Screaming as she tried to figure out what to do with the scarce minutes of free time. Screaming to process what it meant to have a gay ex-husband. Screaming because her own mother was more than 2,000 miles away. She only stopped screaming to eat her scrambled eggs and green chile. Thank you. Wow, that was stunning, Amber. Thank you so much. The primal guttural scream. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, 
And we're now going to welcome Sadie Gleason to the stage. Um, Sadie has received honorable mention for two of our prizes, the Undergraduate Fresno Fiction Prize and the Undergraduate Larry Levis Poetry Prize. Sadie is now a first year MFA student here in the fiction writing program and in her free time she likes to make music and short animation animations. Sadie. Hi everyone. Um, so I'll be reading twice a day and I'm going to start off with my poem, If Clothes Make the Girl. Mom says she'll pay me $100 if I never wear those god awful zebra leggings again. I tell her fashion doesn't have a price. Okay, fine, they were like $8.50 on Amazon, but I feel like a million bucks when I've got them on. Same goes for those neon orange pencil pants mom hates. I hope you don't wear those to work, she says. I don't, I lie, and even worse, if I'm feeling particularly obnoxious, I'll go full traffic cone and mash them with an equally neon windbreaker. Orange is what I wear when I want to be seen but not touched. Bright colors warn predators to stay away. Nobody fucks with a poison dart frog. If clothes make the girl, I play the part of one who takes no shit. That is, until I change into something different, take on a new role, put on a new mask. If clothes make the girl, then who am I with nothing on? And now I'll be reading an excerpt from the middle of my story, Pushing Daisy. When I got home, I was surprised to see my mother was already back from work. She was a housekeeper for some people across town and was usually occupied all morning. I walked quickly through the front room, which was off limits except for when we had guests over, and saw her on the living room couch, picking at it. Don't you want the light on, I asked. Whatever she was doing, it must have been hard to see with the lamp off and the curtains drawn. I flipped the switch, but nothing turned on. Where have you been all day, my mother asked while scraping at the pilled fabric on one of the cushions with her nails. Her voice had a lilting quality to it, teetering on the edge between curiosity and suspicion. It's not even noon yet, I countered, but I was sitting at the coffee place. She just grunted and kept scratching at the couch. Why are you home early, I asked. Why, you don't want me here, she said. She was always saying stuff like that. I chewed on the inside of my cheek, regretting that I even asked. She said she got fired. The family she worked for on Sundays didn't need her anymore now that the kids were old enough to help with chores. I didn't know what to say that wouldn't set her off, so I just watched her keep clawing at the pills. There are too many. You can't get rid of all of them with just your fingers, I wanted to say. It didn't take long for her to realize it on her own. Sit down, Rose, she said, and like a dog on a leash, I obeyed. Briefly, briefly, I wondered if I was even allowed on her couch, or if, like a dog, I'd have to sit on the matted carpet. But the living room couch wasn't sacred like the furniture in the front room. Her glacial gaze followed me and froze me in place on the pilly cushion. It's about time you got a job, hmm, she said, and suddenly I was Daisy when she was 16, or my father before he left and everything fell apart. You're going to have to contribute if you want to continue living here. I wasn't sure if she meant that she'd kick me out or that we'd be evicted. I just nodded. And no more of these silly coffee outings. We need to be spending money on more important things. Like another chandelier, I wanted to say, but that was something da Daisy would have said and it only would have gotten her an earful. I didn't even buy anything I wanted to say, but she'd find some way to make me a liar. Yes, mom, I said, adjusting my buttocks on the uncomfortable seat. And why can't you study at home, she said, her voice taking on a grading note, the pre-course to a full-blown tirade. I thought, I thought my brief excursion was as innocuous as it could get, but my mother's anger was a landmine. The harangue that followed lasted on and off all day. She'd let me go, reload her bullets, then call me back to the living room for another, the next hour for another round of firing, guilt tripping me for leaving, accusing me of not being grateful for what we had, comparing me to my sister and my father. I couldn't hold back the tears. It was the first time she'd yelled since before Daisy disappeared, and I wasn't used to it anymore. The visions of her death rolled through my mind again that night, each iteration of the scene uniquely horrible. I think the worst was the one where she was her own killer. I couldn't begin to say what caused the rift between Daisy and her mom. I suppose it was like the crack along the kitchen ceiling, spreading slowly and noticeably until one day painting over it no longer solved the issue. One day, their long-standing resentment reached a boiling point, and my mother snapped. I wasn't a target of that diatribe, but I felt every blow to my sister as if it were my own. A lot of it had to do with the way my mother set her up against me as a point of comparison. Look at yourself, you're a pig. Don't you take any pride in your appearance? Rose would never let herself go like that. Don't drag me into this, I thought, with my covers pulled over my head, listening from my bed as they fought in the kitchen. 
I couldn't have drowned out her lecture if I tried. It was a Pavlovian instinct to pick out the nuances of my mother's words and prepare myself mentally for the possibility that she'd march into my room and start screaming at me next. When she was really angry, she'd find a way to spin the comparisons both ways to make both of us the problem. The problem with Daisy was she didn't just sit there and take it like I did. Daisy fought back and it opened so many more wounds. Even with two pillows held tight over my head, I caught snippets of the battle. If I left, you'd be screwed. Don't even try me. Daisy's voice was shrill and desperate and didn't at all come across like the threat she probably intended. A sharp laugh from my mother. You can't leave. You're delusional if you think you can afford a place anywhere with that job you have now. That's to say nothing of a car or groceries. An unbearable silence. Look, I have about three months worth of savings before I can't pay the rent anymore. This family needs... Why do you care so much about the goddamn house, Daisy interrupted, but her voice was breathy, hesitant. It's been falling apart since dad left. We can't afford to fix it. If you wanted to live here, maybe you shouldn't have picked such a shit paying job. Another pause. I thought your father, you thought you could leech off him forever, huh? And now that he's not here, you're gonna leech off your daughter instead? You're pathetic. Dad was right to leave. From then on, they spoke hushed words I couldn't quite make out, though the percussive quality of their whispers told me they weren't coming to any sort of agreement. The next day, Daisy didn't come home from work. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Sadie. I um, I just want to listen to these entire stories. I'm like eager to read all of it and read more. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, I need to like find my place again because I'm getting so caught up in these. Um, so next we have James, James Thomas Morrison, who received honorable mention for the undergraduate Fresno Creative Nonfiction Prize. James is a student and writer finishing a BA in English with an emphasis in creative writing. And after graduation, he plans to pursue an MFA in creative nonfiction. He is currently living in Fresno with his wife and their cats. Hello, James, welcome. Hello, thank you. Uh, I will be reading a portion from an essay called The Sinner's Prayer. I watched the men and women file into camp, shoulders stooped after 18 hours on the mountain. They were allowed a few hours to eat and rest, all of them fully aware that while they slept, the fire would jump their line. That's the reality of a new wildfire. It has an endless appetite. Exhausted, they would walk slowly in unison from one station to another, getting dinner, getting drinks, quickly eating and then retreating to their tents. There is a hierarchy amongst wildfire fighters and those who work the line are at its bottom. Line grunts, they're called, a name they wear with pride. They would sit and eat their dinner, nothing visible of their complexion aside from the outline of their goggles, a paint of soot and sweat turned grease covering any visible skin. Watching them gave pause to my internal dialogue, an endless litany of complaints about working conditions and pay, or rather the complete absence of it. My personal suffering always felt a bit less important upon their arrival, so I stayed quiet, dutifully manning my drink tables, making sure the powder mix punch, lemonade, iced tea, and water jug stayed full and cold. I performed numerous tasks for OK's Cascade, a catering company that serviced base camps for major wildfires, but the drink station was my main gig. I had been shooting the shit with OK's employees through four states and five fires. California to Oregon to Idaho, and finally Big Sandy, Montana. Almost all of them had the same, had the same story. They'd humped the job like a dog for four months, earning enough to chill for most of the year. Then they'd collect a little state assistance while waiting for the Western US to catch fire again. I, on the other hand, hadn't seen the dime because I didn't technically work for OKs. I worked for Jeff, a hard-nosed drug addict turned pastor for Teen Challenge a Pentecostal rehab outfit that wasn't exactly for teens, but adults of all ages. I had been working 16 hours, 16 hour days for five weeks without a day off or a paycheck. And I was beginning to wonder if I might prefer the alternative. Then would come a morning when a breeze carried the smoke away from camp, a wide open pink and purple plane would give into the fading bear paw range and that idea would vanish. Indentured servitude was infinitely better than a cinder block cage with a toilet two feet from my sheet metal bunk. At least in Big Sandy, I was outside. That was the alternative for most of us in Teen Challenge. For the most part, we weren't there voluntarily. We had been given two choices, spend a full year in a Christian cult or serve our full sentence. In the early aughts, Teen Challenge had convinced the Bush administration that their program worked for drug addiction when nothing else did. 
that this talk of a disease was hogwash. All people really needed was yea, old Lord, and they claimed great success. According to them, 90% of those who completed the program stayed sober for the rest of their lives. Plastered on the side of every van and headlining every pamphlet was their dubious slogan, the proven cure for the drug epidemic. This, of course, is bullshit. But once the President of the United States began publicly blessing the program, it made its way onto the list of approved treatment centers for the courts. And when I got arrested for the fourth time in less than two years on charges related to alcohol, the judge thought that one last shot at rehab might be a good idea. He wasn't wrong. I needed help. But I highly doubt he knew where he was sending me. And if he did, well, fuck that guy. In those rare free moments of the afternoon when I wasn't napping, I would pore over the only book I was allowed, the good one. I steered clear of any magic, food multiplication, zombie creation, anti-gravity hikes across the ocean, and instead focused on some of the practical life advice. I found most of the Bible wholly unbelievable, ridiculously cruel, and consistently hypocritical, but there were small moments hidden in its books that spoke to me. In Romans, it says, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now that I could get behind. Though I was willing to admit most of it had been self-inflicted, the suffering I felt was real. My life was beginning to fold in on itself. The fact that the Bible wasn't adding up for me was a source of distress, something I was actively trying to fix. As improbable as it seemed, perhaps there was, some, perhaps there was something to this idea of being saved. That was so great, James. Thank you. Um, I selfishly hope you come work with us in our MFA program. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next up, we have Gaoyang Yang Vang, winner of the Seoul Vang Prize for Poetry. Gaoyang is in her second year in the MFA program studying poetry. She is currently the president for Hmong American Ink and Stories, abbreviated HI. Gao's work is published in the first edition of Hai, a literary journal. She is also part of the space known as the Laureate Lab Visual Wordist Studio in the Henry Madden Library with Poet Laureate Emeritus, Emeritus Juan Felipe Herrera and Laureate Labbers Anthony Cody, Mariah Bosch and Law Lab Fellows. Please join me in welcoming Gao. Hi Gao. Hello everyone. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Bryn. Um, uh, tonight I will be reading my poem titled My Will. Here it goes. Do not sacrifice an animal to give me a spirit guide. I will not understand the roads with my drums and, and gang lay before me. I am unable to recognize my faceless ancestors. Let me hear sounds of poetry an orchestra of friends cries until burning incense finishes bowing. That way my true love will not have to stay for days worshiping my dead body, overlooking, protecting, cradling. Empty heartache, empty heartache instead reciting gentle words hidden on a cloudy day, chanting, singing, voicing as I stand aside listening to them as others have listened to me. Thank you. Thank you, Gal. I love your poetry. It's so wonderful to hear it tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, our next reader has submitted a video recording, so we're going to um, switch to that in a second. Callie Camara is the winner of the undergraduate Larry Levis Poetry Prize and the winner of the undergraduate Fresno Fiction Prize. Callie is a fiction writer and poet from Hanford. She is currently a first year MFA student studying fiction. Callie enjoys reading, writing, and drawing and is one of many writers who loves spending time with her cats. Her stories often incorporate magical realism or the slightly abnormal like makeup kits that can alter faces or grieving granddaughters who steal tomatoes. Callie has pre-recorded her reading for us, so we will present that to you now. the fantastic stories and poems that we Hi, my name is Callie Camara. I'm sorry that I couldn't be here in person tonight to read my poem to you, 
but I hope that you all enjoy all the fantastic stories and poems that will be shared tonight. Um, before I share my poem, I'd like to thank not only the Fresno State Creative Writing Department and the English Department, but also the Friends of Larry Levis for funding this poetry prize, and also all the other donors who fund the other prizes for this poetry uh, prose uh, awards that Fresno State holds every year. Um, it's been great working with Jefferson Beavers and Professor Saito over the years, and I'm very glad to be here and to read in the showcase. So the poem that I'm going to read, uh, I wrote in response to a story that my father told me that I then documented, and um, it, it came about when we were hanging out as a family uh, in the backyard. We have like a hot tub and we'll sit in there with, you know, drinks and um, he told this story and it just stood out to me and it was a silly story, you know, it wasn't meant to be like serious or anything, but I decided to um, kind of immortalize that memory in this poem, so I'd like to share it with you all today. It's called a story from my father, age 16, is told while sitting in the hot tub and drinking coffee. Have you heard about the time my teenage friends and I were fucking around on my friend's motorcycle? On the back country roads where all that surrounded us was orchards and cows, and our parents were at home, and to them, who knows where we were? When we rubbed up that motorcycle, brakes clenched, wheels churning, rubber burning against the fractured asphalt, and I hopped on the back tire's wheel guard. Only the motorcycle squealed up on one wheel, and I fell back, clutching Dave's shirt as that thing blasted forward, 40 feet through the dirt. That tire gnarled up my chest like chicken's breast, that's for sure. And you're staring at me in horror, but I'm alive, aren't I? Thank you. We're going to um, queue up a second video from uh, Callie. So just give us a second here. Hello again. I'll be reading an excerpt from my winning piece for the Fresno fiction undergraduate prize, so I hope you all enjoy. The story is called Ugly Shaped Tomatoes. They say some people die of grief, but that's not what killed my grandmother. Five months after my grandfather died, she slipped in the bathtub and fell. I was the one who found her. It was a couple hours after the fact. She was curled up on the floor of her walk-in shower. There's a pale, flabby skin folding over themselves as she laid with her chin tucked against her chest and her legs folded beside her. By that time, the ruddy flush that normally graced her paunchy cheeks was gone, but in its place, the red tiles of the shower wall gleamed under the sheen of water. Nothing was out of place, not the soap, the shampoo bottles. It was as though she had laid down on the floor and been lulled to sleep by the falling water. I almost left the shower running while I called the coroner. Her face was that peaceful. After her funeral, I went back to her house to help sort through her belongings. In the toy room at the back of the house, which was not so much a playroom, but a storeroom where all the miscellaneous toys her grandchildren had outgrown, all of her craft tools, needles, thread, a basket of yarn, and a half-finished scarf on a circular loom were shoved haphazardly into the closet. When I slid the wooden door open, shoving it hard so that it didn't snag on the mottled gray carpet, a tomato-shaped pincushion rolled off a stack of boxes and landed by my foot. I recognized it from my youth, Summers spent at my grandparents' house, watching Grandma sew. It didn't look much like I remembered, though. By now, its fabric skin was frayed with holes, and the green felt on top was threatening to separate from the tomato entirely. 
It was so beat up that for a second, I questioned whether Grandma had abandoned it to her cat, Benny, as a toy, before ultimately tossing it in here. It was honestly quite ugly. I started stealing tomatoes from the supermarket a few weeks later. The ugliest ones quickly became decorations throughout my house, taking residence on the bookshelves, tables, and empty spaces on top of my desk. Why the ugly ones? Well, the perfectly round ones just don't do the trick. There's something so appealing about the appearance of the ugly ones, the baby smoothness of their skin, paired with the deep crevices where they fold in on themselves, like a piece of glass overblown inside a metal frame. They're the perfect lumpiness to decorate my coffee table with. They even match the frumpy cushions I inherited from my grandmother. I've been questioned about my decorative habits by my friends, my therapist, my parents, even my estranged aunt. One time my friend suggested that I use the tomatoes for cooking, like they're intended, she said. But me, cooking? I'm like my grandmother in that respect. She was a lady raised in the 50s, the perfect atomic wife, slim-bodied and blonde hair curled nicely, with a husband in the Navy and two children to carry on the name. But she hated cooking. Lord, did she hate cooking. Sometimes I wonder how my mother didn't starve to death growing up. Well, she was anorexic as a teenager, but that's not the point. Grandma wasn't a great cook even when I was around. Grandpa was the main supplier of meals in the house, once he retired and came back from the war. All that time tinkering on planes as a mechanic gave him a skilled hand. He was a master of the microwave ego pancake. He had a strategy for cutting them so that the butter and syrup perfectly coated the surface for the most balanced, delectable bite. He wasn't a chef by any means, but nothing could beat having one of his famous pancakes on an early summer morning. His skills were also good for making grandma jewelry. She'd pick out pretty gemstones at the annual Gemstone Emporium held in the dinky community center downtown, where old men and ladies in questionably Indiana Jones-esque vests and hats would lounge around in plastic fold-out chairs and try to peddle their wares to you from across the counter like they were selling the crystal skull. Grandpa would take the gems she picked out and wrap sterling silver wires around them so that they could be hooked onto a necklace chain. I remember him gripping the pliers in his hands, not yet gnarled by arthritis, but beginning to tremble. The liver spots on the back of his white fingers, the sallowness of his skin next to the dusty rose pink color of the pliers handles. Grandma always gravitated towards the turquoise gemstones. My theory is that they were soothing to her. She always liked water and the sound of waves. Maybe because when she was a kid, she lived in Michigan, where the roads were framed with lush foliage, and there was the sound of water stirring in the lakes around every bend. But then, they, but then the Navy relocated Grandpa to California when they were driving up the 41 towards Lemoore, the story goes that she cried and cried at the sight of the tall, dead yellow grasses stretching as far as the eye could see. I wonder if she thought her tears would revitalize them. And that's where I'll end it for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Callie. Um, I'm so glad Callie was able to send in those videos um, for us to hear her selections this evening. They were so beautiful. So if you see Callie on campus or in your next uh, Zoom meeting with Callie, please give her lots of love. Um, so before we, we're gonna play a second video, well, our second video of the evening. I just wanted to mention some of the folks who uh, couldn't make it tonight to read or submit a video, but who, who were still prize winners this evening. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge two students who were runner up and honorable mention respectively for the graduate level 
Ernesto Trejo Poetry Prize, and that's Angela Flores and Andrea A. Marin Contreras. Um, writer Caroline Matza received honorable mention for the graduate level Fresno Fiction Prize. And finally, Jur Zhang, who received honorable mention for the graduate level Fresno Creative Nonfiction Prize. So sending all of them lots of love tonight. Um, and next up, we are going to hear a short video from Aiden Castro, who was the winner of the Ernesto Trejo Poetry Prize for the graduate students, and also the uh, and uh, also the Mia Brazza Martinez Prize for Social Justice Writing. Aiden is a third year MFA student in poetry, and um, we will play you Aiden's Aiden's video now. Hi, I'm Aiden Castro, and this is my Ernesto Trajo Memorial Prize winning poem, I Anesthetic Back From 10. I anesthetic back from 10, open my lids to find my brainstem reattached and bound by staples stretched across my chest. This body that is now my body runs tangerine through trees. My calls to God sutured rippled water to the rain. I reach into a scrub jay's nest and crack open each inhale and I exhale desire for many more years, more than wishes for concrete shoes and an ocean walk. I nest in further and pick my eyes one socket at a time, wash them in soft dirt and put them back in to find every head tilt refracts the earth's lights and colors. I try to grab them all out of the sky as if they will fall and be taken from me again. I swallow what could fit in my hands. I am all the shades of red that weep into drainage tubes pierced through my side. Thank you very much. And I think Jefferson, do we have one more from Aiden? Is it, okay, great, awesome, thank you. Hi, I'm Aiden Castro, and this is my Moretta Barraza Martinez Prize for Social Justice Reading award-winning poem, The Revision of Section 1557. One. I enter the crosswalk by 7-Eleven and my body collides with a car at 40 miles per hour. I, A, roll across the hood and fly off the windshield. B, suffer fractured hip and broken ribs on impact. C, experienced punctured lungs, left arm skin bursting from bone. Two. Bystanders scream and call 911. The ambulance groans within earshot. The EMTs, A, hoist my mangled body to gurney. B, S cut my shirt with trauma shears. C, expose surgical scars across my chest. Three, they speed to St. Mercy. I am pulled into the emergency room taken for assessment. The surgeon stares at my body and he, A, turns away in disgust. B, tells the nurse he cannot help me. C, stuffs my wounds with crumpled scripture from the Bible. Four, nurses panic and scramble to keep my vitals from dropping. They make calls to find another surgeon. The nearest is hours away. They wait to transfer me to another hospital. It is a struggle to handle the weight of my eyelids. I, A, pray to God to find someone to have compassion for this body. B, pray to God to be able to breathe on my own. C, pray to God to see another day. Thank you. That was stunning. That was stunning. 
wonderful Aiden and sending love from all of us to you this evening for those beautiful, beautiful poems. Um, so glad you're able to record those and share those with us today. Hmm. Okay, we have um, four more readers for you tonight who are going to be reading live. Um, and so I'd like to uh, introduce to you Maya Elise Carney next. Maya Elise is the winner of the Fresno Fiction Prize for graduate students. Maya Elise is a second year MFA student studying fiction, and she's an editor at the Normal School. And her writing has appeared in places like Hobart, Maudlin House, and Atlas and Alice. Please join me in welcoming Maya Elise. Hi, Maya Elise. Hi, thank you, Professor Fido, and thank you everyone for listening to me. I'm really excited to be here among such talented writers and readers. So tonight I'm going to read the first few pages of my short story titled The Hydrangea Fairy. There's a fairy in the hydrangea bush just outside my bedroom window. She's been visiting me for the last few months every night, right in the watery soft moments between awake and asleep. I met her first during the illness. It was an early spring when I lost my balance and the world slipped wet like sand through my fingers. I could only stand for a few moments before my ears buzzed and the cream yellow walls of my apartment tilted as I melted into the liquid edges of my vision. For two weeks, I laid in bed trembling with nausea, the hydrangea fairy nestling into the cup of my ear, whispering to me all the ways she saw me drowning or dying or dead. When I recovered, I had hoped the hydrangea fairy would move on in search of a better body to burrow into, but she sticks to the routine. She creeps into my ear every night. The hydrangea fairy arrives in the shadows on my wall. She shivers, small enough to be a praying mantis, but sneaky enough, creepy, creepy enough to be some kind of rodent, sentient. Even in the shadow, she has an almost human shape, with a skirt made of tulips and twitching wind, wings so translucent and thin, I can only see the faintest outline, like two little almonds shaved down to a perfect snapping crunch. She shuffles across my windowsill, drops down heavily onto my crisp white sheets beside my pillowcase, huffs and scrambles to keep from sliding down to splat messily onto the hard wooden floor. Her sharp spider hands grip the cartilage of my ears, dragging herself up like she might crawl right in. I feel terror, warm and thick, bubble just beneath my ribcage. She nestles herself into the couch of my ear, her tiny heels thump something against my lobe. Her warm breath rustles, craggled and husky, thick with ash. I see you first in water, she says. I see you drowning in a tub. The hydrangea fairy never says hello, never asks me about my evening or how work is or if I'm enjoying the warmer weather, but she always tells me about my death. She never leaves out a detail. She's very precise. I'll be wearing a shower cap with bright orange flowers. I'll have eaten a dinner of deviled ham and black olive sandwiches, but that won't be the reason I drown. It's always something far less sinister. I'll have fallen asleep in the moldy gloom and will slip under so slowly I won't even notice all the water trickling down my nose and into my lungs, floating my stomach up like a fish. I'll wake, but by then it'll already be too late. And no matter how hard I cough and cry, I won't be able to get it all up. The whole time you struggle, she says, like you're convinced you can keep yourself afloat. I tremble under the thin cover. I sweat and gulp big, wet, slummy blobs down into the acid of my stomach. I never reply. I'm too scared, and I don't know what I would say if I could. I listen to her belled feet tap tap against my ear and am lulled to sleep by her humming. In the morning, I wake with a cramp in my neck and a stitch in my stomach. I walk to work at the factory early in the humid mornings, just as the sun peaks its hairline over the horizon. At the puzzle factory, I work on the assembly line where I glue pictures onto rough cardboard. I hold a splintered wooden brush and make the blurry images glossy and perfect and whole before the machine down the line stamps them into a hundred pieces, a continual shattering of broken kittens and horses and flaking wheels of cheese. I've worked at the factory for a long time, at least seven years. It's hard to get a good job, so I'm grateful. I was assigned a tiny ready-made apartment and I'm not allowed to change the furniture inside, but I moved it all just a few inches to the right so that it felt like mine, like a home. Before I lived with Papa, but I had to leave when he said he was moving away from the city. He didn't like how I clung to him, how my days stretched long before me like strips of undulating desert, buzzing and hollow and dry. He said that I needed to be useful and now all I want is to be useful. 
so I work enough to pay my rent and buy some canned foods, and I never have any money left over. That's fine with me. I already have everything I should ever want. Now I get to work early and relinquish my body to the repetition. Sunflowers, glue, press. Church, glue, press. The only difference is which picture I'm pressing, and even then, they're given to their own repetition. I've never left the city, but at the Puzzle Factory, I've seen every major destination, every religious temple, every rolling hill, every private woodland knoll. At the Puzzle Factory, I forget the outside. I forget the hydrangea fairy. I focus on the glue, my trembling fingers, and the lulling voice of my line mate Belinda working across from me. Belinda talks the whole time, a constant hum in tune with the something of the belt. I'm sure she's told me everything she's ever saw or thought or felt, and I keep it all tucked inside of me. I hold on to it like currency. I know her husband's favorite television show. I know about her grandfather's illegal dog racing business. I've been there for all of her root canals, every crowning. I can feel, feel the sharp stinging prick in my finger every time she checks her sugars with that little beeping thing she keeps tucked inside her apron pocket. Her hands pour, push, pull, press against the wet, wet fat eyes of a bear in a field of buzzing daisies. Her mouth gnaws, prances, empties. Her orange curls faded a sunset gray, fell out of her knotted hairnet. A cloud of ring on a rusting copper chain thumps something against her sun-spotted chest. I listen and listen and she never looks up and sometimes I wonder if she'll tell stories about me after I drown in the tub. Thank you. Wow, thanks Miley, so stunning. Thank you so much. I love hearing, I had the chance to hear um, your beautiful fiction, thank you. Next up we have Michelle Ferrer Alvarez who received honorable mention for the undergraduate Larry Levis Poetry Prize. Michelle is a student at Fresno State who's in love with English literature. She is, she is also passionate about theology, philosophy, church history, and translating classical and ecclesiastical works in Latin and Greek. Her current topic of study is the work of St. Hildegard von Bingen. As a writer, Michelle is influenced by the natural world and how its forms reflect mysteries of the transcendent and the sacred. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. And thank you so much to Brandon Jefferson for putting this together. Um, my poem is called uh, St. Clair's Response. Mother, I have harbored my heart in the safety of your clay white hands. In them, I have let love sleep, afraid that it awaken too soon, too soon to the floral tales of the wind, to verses whispered in the ebb and flow of the maddened midnight sea. But mother, the time is here when the harvest must be reaped. A broken man, a hungry God stands before me. Sad blossom in his heart bleeds, harrowed petals upon my marble feet. Lightning is his gray blue eyes and silence thunders in his hallowed face. He cannot forgive my absence any more than a lover hinging at the altar. He cannot release my wrist for I give him my words, my eyes in one ignitable promise to him the planetary blue of my mind over and over. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful reading. Thank you so much. The silence thunders and the dogs start barking all at the same. <laughs> I think my dogs are responding to your dogs and it was, um, but that was gorgeous. It all came through beautifully. Thank you, Michelle. Next up, we have Tony Bang. Tony was runner up for the undergraduate Larry Levis Poetry Prize. He's a first year MFA student here at Fresno State and in poetry. In the COVID-19 quarantine, Tony discovered his affinity for composing love poems using words that capture and display his personal firsthand experiences, observations, and emotions. Please join me in welcoming Tony. Greetings, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and big thanks to Jefferson and Bryn for putting this together. The poem I'll be reading tonight is titled Juan Felipe's Harvest Festival. Based on a true story, Juan Felipe emailed the Labbers and said, do you all want to help me come clean out my Daryl's mini storage? Labbers assembled and we essentially helped him clean out his mini storage. All right, so 
Juan Felipe's Harvest Festival. Masked and gloved, we effort to ignition our bags into the farming, unearthing and hauling bundled collections. Story dust osmosis their way into our bloodstreams, autographs and blurbs un uncoil from hibernation to dance, to echo, to voices, cadence of stacking books. We laugh celebration, existence knowledge, pride from guardian gates and shadow shrouds. Under the sun that watched the laboring birthing of these manuscripts, we orbit, we hummingbird, one pass into another, organizing time. We turn fertilizer into fertile, stir unpublished volumes using photosynthesis, medicine one cup of light, one root of water, one song of wind, to begin excavation of green scripts, inked fruits, visual word fossils to take home. Each of us taking pages to plant in our future garden. Thank you. Mm, beautiful, Tony. I want to visit that future garden for sure. I love it. Thank you so much. Our final um, reader this evening is Ceci Hernandez. Monharis, winner of the undergraduate Fresno Creative Nonfiction Prize and winner of the undergraduate Mia Barraza Martinez Prize for Social Justice Writing. Ceci is an aspiring poet and a first year MFA student. Hello, Ceci. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I'll get, um, I'll be sharing um, my screen right now if the host can disable um, the share screen. Here we go. Ceci, you are on mute. Okay. Uh, so this is the this is called Roma, and this is by the Mia um, Mireida Mia Barasa Martinez Prize. It was selected by Anthony Cody, and I will be reading some of it. I, hopefully, a lot of it. Roma, city limit. Population 9765, US warning signs, gun sign. The average response time of a 911 call is 23 minutes. The response time of a 357 is 1400 feet per second. Flag sign, no trespassing, proud to be American. Prohibido el paso, caution sign, a family crossing, mother, father, daughter, US. U.S. Army National Guard units use thermal energy, imagery, technology to stop anyone from crossing the river. Caught on smartphone, abandoned building, crossers hiding among bats. Crossers run like deer on highways. Residents, Mexican descendants, always on the lookout, fear, gang members, want, regulation, and enforcement. If they did not cross the river, where would we be? Border patrol boats scan the river. People no longer go near, no longer a picnic area overgrown with bush and weed. If a wall is built, people will lose their homes and birds their sanctuary. What right do you have from taking my home? Border crossers are driven to the US detention center 50 miles away. They spend their life savings paying smugglers only to find themselves detained by U.S. Customs and Border Protection bans like bad hombres. Rio Grande, 300 miles, 500 kilometers, more than a thousand immigrants cross per month, mostly Central Americans. I am swept behind trees, my body murky and dirty green. I listen the way a river is supposed to listen, men paddle, across and bring with them women, children, young men. Everything is normal. You wouldn't suspect anything different except their skin betrays them. Meanwhile, another group of men smuggle narcotics, 
above, blimps with cameras surround my body, blimps which have become a virtual border wall. Surveillance towers with cameras keep me from breathing. Crickets continue ticking nearby. Street lights reflect human smugglers by the riverbank. Return to the Mexican side. Estos patos no dejan pasar para vivir una vida buena. Smugglers seldom carry weapons. In the chilly evening, border patrols strip adults and children, shoes, shoelaces, shirts, and toys searching for weapons. An agent begins to gather their belongings in a plastic bag. A boy removes layers of clothes. Another agent removes a boy's jacket, searches his stomach and under his pants. Meanwhile, his mother blankly stares. The boy spreads his arms without complaining. Somewhere behind the camera, a child screams. She won't let go of her mother, her only sanctuary. Mexico. Hay algo oscuro en el viento. Tiemblo de tanto miedo. Daría esta vida sin pensarlo dos veces. Para escapar hay que luchar. Soy capaz de olvidar esto. Ya no es vivir. Me estoy ahogando en la noche. Siempre te recordaré. Me pregunto qué... Me pregunto qué me espera. El peligro. Estoy dispuesto a sacrificarlo todo. Por mis hijos estoy cansado. Solo quiero un poco de agua. Algo de comer, extraño a mi familia, no puedo dejar de preocupar. Estoy tan cerca de la muerte, ni el miedo me queda. Rezo por un buen pasaje, pase lo que pase, no hagas ningún ruido. Aquí viene la migra, no llores, sé fuerte, no dejaré que nadie te lastime, no dejaré que nadie nos separe. Lágrimas son como sudor, te amo siempre. El viento llora de tanto rabia. Con Continúa el canto de los pájaros, ubicación, sonido de advertencia, notas agudas. Siempre cantan con dolor, siempre con la ilusión de un mejor futuro. Um, I will be reading my next. Um, I will be reading my next work. Uh, it's called Mujeres de las Nubes and it was selected by Ashley Wells. I will be reading fragments of it since it is pretty long and time is short. Mujeres de las Nubes. Abuela, Reni, and I lived in a small village in Oaxaca. There were no doors or windows. The kitchen and bed were in the same space, just a few feet away from each other. Sometimes we slept on the floor, the earth hard and cold. It was the only thing we knew for years. We could barely call it home, but that's exactly what it was. I didn't know we were so poor. We had to shower inside the river. Our dresses playing in the water and our bodies free. Abuela would wash our clothes while Reni and I scattered rocks, admired the red flowers that grew on the outskirts and stared at our blurred reflections. But then again, I was too naive to understand. It was as if everything was as it was meant to be. Abuela was so thin and fragile, I was afraid I might break her bones whenever she asked me to sit on her. When she came back from work, she would rub her neck and massage her legs. Even after making so many patates, she only earned a few pesos. There were nights she asked me to relieve her pain by sitting on top of her, and I obeyed with caution. When I sat on her, the fear never subsided. She never took notice as she stared off into the sunset. Outside, it was dead quiet, but the air was fresh and endless. When night unfolded, she asked, ¿Qué haría si ya no estuviera aquí? I didn't know what she meant. I assumed she was going somewhere, so I said, iré contigo, ma. I didn't know anything about death. I just knew she was as good as my mother and I wanted to protect her, but I couldn't tell her. It's hard to say, Te seguiré, ma. lo prometes? I nodded. Our first and only promise, no matter where she went, I would follow. Everywhere we went, I felt the beat of the earth rub against our sandals. The mud leveled on our toes and above our ankles. There were no rows, just miles of dirt. Because there wasn't anything to play with, I pretended the rocks and stones were soldiers and made them fight with each other. I scared birds off with slingshots and bullied Jenny. Even though she was my aunt and just a year older, I bitterly called her Janata Sanata and she would retort with Checha Becha. I can't remember what we meant, but we kept insulting each other in our dialect Zapoteco. 
Lenny never got the chance to fully experience Abuela's affection. She was the youngest of five children, yet she was sad and lonely. When I came along out of nowhere, I saw her mother's affection. Years later, she would let me know how much this still hurts her. At the expense of Abuela's love was Lenny's suffering. Sometimes when I think of home, I remember the bush jolt with ladybugs. Above me, the sun is sharp. I don't know why it's special. As the years build up, things are slightly off, and with each passing time, there are less details. The bush is gone. The ladybugs are no longer red or yellow. It's hard to hold and swallow. I can't tell if I was ever there or if home still exists. The day father arrived, Abuela welcomed him, and when he tried to hug him, I scratched his face. He wanted to take me along to the other side, but I couldn't leave her. I was afraid of the stranger that sat next to me. The only talk that kept repeating was of La Migra. I didn't, I didn't really pay attention, but was strictly told to behave and to always keep quiet. I kept nodding my head, refusing to speak to him. When we walked the desert, it felt more like a passing dream. I rode on his back the whole journey. Only Jenny and Abuela braced the harsh conditions and consequences. When I awoke, we were in the backseat of a car. I'd never witnessed such commotion as hundreds of them sped by. I stared outside the window and smiled. I had never seen so many lights before. It was magical, everything twinkling, and I felt something I'd never felt a sense of awareness. I wasn't afraid because Abuela and Reni were there. One night, Abuela went to the store to buy groceries. Since father was away with the van and my mother didn't have a car, Abuela had to walk in the middle of the night. Reni and I were doing something I can't remember. After a while, my mother received a call. She looked panicked and began shouting. I don't know how it happened, but before I knew it, Reni and I were sprinting. There were many things racing through our heads, but we both felt a desperate kind of fear. I've described the moon a thousand times, and each time it follows like a lost child. I can't remember what Abuela looked like, but the moon was full and bitter. Perhaps she was wearing a thin blouse with a long skirt and her hair braided back. There were two or three police cars. The owner of the store had called them over, claiming she had stolen food. But when they checked the cameras in her bag, they couldn't prove anything. It was too late, though. They found out she was illegally here growing up. I was always wary of the police. They were not to be trusted. My instinct kicked in as Jenny and I approached the crowd of people. When Jenny started crying, I bit in, I hid in a corner away from where the police stood with Abuela's arms locked behind her. I was frozen with fear and was, and was afraid that if I stepped any further, the cops would take me. I never felt more cowardly than that night. Jenny begged and shouted for them to let go of her mother. Abuela's eyes were deeply red. And, and her beaten down face and her beaten down face is the last thing is the last thing that remains clear to this day then he was left to suffer as they took her away and all i could do and all i could do was watch in the looming darkness our neighbor had come over to pick us up and i remember sitting there as he drove in silence but I don't know if Renny drove in the car or if she stayed behind. Everything was hazy. My mind had left me. I felt this strange sensation that would never leave. That night, I broke my promise and betrayed Abuela. I couldn't protect her. I couldn't do what Renny did. Ever since, I have dreamt of her more than once. Abuela was deported back to Oaxaca. We hardly ever spoke of the incident. Renny stopped smiling for the longest time. She became more reserved and started working in the fields. She kept everything to herself and our relationship drifted. In many ways, I remained a child and she grew up. Waka was less than a star away, yet distance made me forget. I didn't believe things would ever change. Under the canopy of trees between Fresno and N Street, where she and I sat for hours on end, I tried remembering. When we sat there, it felt like home, the trees obscuring reality and the dirt curling in our fingers, that same earth. I never expected her to follow, but there she was every time in our sandals, her skirt undis undisturbed by wind, and that sorrowful look I'll never forget. Over time, it became harder to remember. I couldn't breathe the way I wanted to. I was fading into obscurity and I felt miserable. I sat there waiting for her to come. But every time I listened to the grass rustle, I thought of her promise and how I betrayed her. I thought of how she slept under the same darkness and how I now kept her company. Thank you everyone. Have a nice day. Hmm, Sassy. Thank you so much for that. Um, I feel like I'm gonna just start crying here. Um, that was such a beautiful um, tribute 
um, to the spirit of the award and um, just as a testament to your power as an artist. Um, <laughs> I want to just thank all of you wonderful writers for sharing your work tonight, your poetry, your stories, um, and just, you know, turning towards the most complex uh, moments of your life and making art out of it and bringing that to us in the community and just sort of, you know, being vulnerable and open to doing that um, was such a gift to spend this hour with all of you. And so...